All right. Uh, welcome back uh, again. Uh, thank you all so much for your giving. Uh, again, we. <clears throat> uh, I see the comments. Uh, thank you for your texts, those and who are commenting about the videos and about the uh, the lag. Uh, I have no idea what that is. Uh, I just bought this computer, so uh, I'm gonna go today to see if the if it's the processor in this computer or just buy another one. So. Um, and I'll make sure that it's it's right for Wednesday night. So for those people who are commenting, I got your comments. I don't know why it's cutting out. Um, it was working a couple weeks ago, so but I'll I'll take care of it. So I'm gonna go today uh, to the Geek Squad and let them <laughs> let them analyze it. Okay, uh, I'm a geek, but not to that nature. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna let them analyze it and, and see what I need because whatever it is I need, I'm just gonna buy it. So. Um, and we can do that. But again, thank you all so much for uh, your patience and working with us, those people who are still watching the videos and comment. I appreciate that. And so I'll make sure that it's, uh, we have the right equipment for, for Wednesday night. All right? Uh, so let's go back, to, go back and turn to 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, all right? Let's go to, where do we leave off? Right at about verse 26, 27. Yeah, right about verse 26, all right? Look at this, the last, uh, so we talked about the last, uh, uh, the resurrection, okay? And again, this chapter is speaking about the resurrection and the power of the resurrection, what it actually provides for us, okay? And we just went through some of those things, all right? Look at verse 25, 1 Corinthians 15, for he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. So again, Paul is talking about the resurrection, the order of the resurrection, how it's going to happen, and we've just broken down those things, how it's going to happen for each dispensation and at, even at the end, okay? Verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All right, now look at verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him, okay? All right, now. Look at verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things unto him, that God may be all in all. All right? Yes. 27. Uh-huh. Half. Past tense. Uh-huh. So it's already done. All right. Now, done in what sense? He already put all things under his feet. It just says here it has to be manifest. Right? right. So now, look at verse 28. And when all things what? Shall be. Shall be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something has happened, but something else still has to happen. And this is the key. Because most people think that we're living in the kingdom now. Does Christ rule this earth? No. no. Evidently not. Okay. That's, that should be obvious to some folks. To say that we're living in the kingdom now and to have all this chaos going on in the world in which we live, that should be completely obvious to people that we're not living in the kingdom now, okay? Christ is not the ruler of this earth now. Satan is the God of this world, okay? Until we get a new heaven and a new earth, then will everything that we see now will be the uh, the the satanic policy of evil, satanic policy of evil going on, okay? That's what we see now, all right? And so understand, it says, for he had put all things under his what? Feet. Feet. So there's some things that has happened, all right? Let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Verse 1. Colossians chapter number 1. All right, now, look at verse 18. Now, this is what was kept secret since the world began. Now, look at verse 18, and he is the head of the what? 
The who? Church. Who was the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the what? Preeminence. The preeminence. All right. For it pleased the Father that in him should all what? Fullness dwell. So all things are put under him, okay? Because in him shall all fullness what? Dwell. dwell. Okay, go to Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 9. Let's start at verse 8. Look at Colossians 2, verse 8. Starts off with what? Beware. Beware. All right? Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after who? For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, what? Bodily. So God the Father, God the Son, all the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ, what? Bodily. All right? Which means that he is God, and all things exist in him and by him. And for him, okay? Look at verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and what? Power. And power, okay? Go to Philippians. Chapter number 3. And again, Paul is dealing with this issue of the resurrection. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that we have that lives in us to overcome sin. All right? Look at this. Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may do what? Win Christ. Now, watch this now. Look at verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own what? Righteousness. Which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by what? Faith. By faith. Look at verse 10. Why? Why is all of this important? That I may know him and the what? Power of his resurrection. There we go. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his what? Suffering. Being made conformable unto his what? Death. This is the power that we have in us. Now, notice with the power of the resurrection, we also have the fellowship of his what? Sufferings. Which means that we're going to suffer some things for what? Christ's sake. Knowing that we have the power of his resurrection residing in us, okay? Because we're being made conformable unto his what? Death. Because if we be dead with him, we also are what? Risen with him. You see that? So the same power that's working in the, that worked in the resurrection is the same power that works in us. All right? Look at verse 11. If by any means I might at attain unto the resurrection of the what? Yeah. Of the dead. Not as though I had already what? Attained it. Has he already attained it? Christ. He, right. So and Christ is in us. But Paul is saying, I'm continuing to go as if I have not already what? Attained it. The life that we live now is not a life that's trying to get to heaven. It's a life that's pleasing to God because we already have heaven. Okay? So now our gratitude for what Christ has already done and given us it should be one of faith. Our walk should be one of faithfulness. Not perfection, but what? Faithfulness. All right? God is not looking for perfection out of us. He's looking for faithfulness out of us. All right? Because the only perfect person was Christ himself. Right? So God is not looking for us to be perfect. He's looking for us to be what? Faithful. All right? Look at this. Not as though I had, verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already what? Perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So I'm trying to live a life in Christ that Christ has already given to me. You see that? Uh -huh. Can you explain that when you mentioned that um, we're not supposed that God doesn't expect us to live to be perfect? To be perfect, but He's supposed to be faithful. So right. explain a faithful lifestyle. What is that? The faithful lifestyle is one that's Second Timothy two fifteen. Studying to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
All right. Working out. As a matter of fact, where are we at? Philippians. Uh, go to Philippians three. Go back to verse twelve. Uh, two, verse twelve. I'm sorry. Philippians 2 verse 12 so this is what it ha this is what the faithfulness has to do with okay and again this is a verse that's taken entirely out of context but watch this verse 12 wherefore my beloved as ye have always obeyed not as in my what Praise so when Paul was there they would obey him because he was there all right but now much more in my what yes. work out your own salvation with what Fear and trembling. Now, people say, see, it's work we got to do. See, we got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, what is Paul saying? Is he telling them to work out their own salvation to be saved or do the things as you obey when I'm here because you are saved, do the same things to obey when I'm not there? See that? He's not saying to work for the salvation. He's saying to work out. Okay? Now, just take back to the instance of training. I work out all the time. What am I actually working out? I'm working out, all right, and extending muscles and those things that I already have. I'm not working out to get it. I'm working out to maintain that which I already have, okay? So understand when they're talking about working out your own salvation, he's talking about working on something you already have, not working to obtain it, all right? And that kind of speaks to character. Absolutely. Integrity, character, things that we ought to have because of who we are in Christ. Okay? All right, now, and even <clears throat> understand that a lot of times it, it will seem as though, okay, when people come against those of us who are in Christ, okay, it may seem as though you're the bad guy. All right? Uh, even when it came to my old church, okay? It suddenly became an instance where everybody turned as if I was the bad person, okay? Simply because I was just standing for truth, okay? And so a lot of times people may paint a picture because they did the same thing to Christ. So I expect them to do it to me also, okay? So understand when it comes to certain individuals and people, all right, people, let people talk and say whatever they want to say. You just remain calm and you do the things that, you, that you're supposed to do, okay? People are going to say and talk they did the same thing to Jesus, all right? So understand when we're working on our own salvation with fear and trembling, that's a lot to do with character and integrity. And a lot of times, even when you're in a position of character and showing integrity, others may not say so. Okay? So, so, so again, that's not for us to debate or battle. What people say is what people say. Okay? All you can control is what you do. All right? Look at verse 9. The key to verse 12 is actually verse 13. Verse, verse 13 of Philippians 2 starts off with what word? Four. So further explanation, he's going to show you and tell you how to work out this salvation with fear and trembling. For what? It is God. It is God which does what? Worketh in you. Worketh, E-T-H, which means continually in you, both to will and to do of what? His good pleasure. So the way that we remain faithful, the, main, the way that we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling has to do with us allowing God to work in us, and he only works in us by way of what we know, studying to show ourselves approved unto God. Right? So God wants us to be faithful to him and his word. All right? He's not expecting us to be perfect knowing that sin dwells in the flesh, and we all have a battle between flesh and spirit. All right? And don't complain about it. Uh, don't murmur. That's, that's the next thing. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Absolutely. What was the book of Phil uh, Philippians written about? Was it reproof or? In, in regards to what? In regards to why he was selling the Philippians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they had a, uh, 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 they were real uh, 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 sensual in their, their understanding, okay, uh, in their behavior, okay? So Paul was reproving them of this. And most time, and again, when you look at the book, book of Philippians, they were doing things based on who they thought they were from a status or sensual standpoint. That's why he says, listen, I count, I'm, if it comes to uh, comparison in the flesh, I'm more. I was uh, of the stock of the tribe of Benjamin. I was circumcised the eighth day. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. But all of that doesn't really mean anything. Because even today, most people, okay, will judge you based on your status. All right, based on your status. All right, so now if I come looking a certain way, oh, he must be somebody or she must be somebody. 
right? But if I don't come looking a certain way, then I'm not a person of status. And so because of status, okay, people will either do certain things for you or they won't based on your status. Doesn't make it right, doesn't make it fair, it's just the way it is, okay? So understand that when it comes to uh, this issue of the Philippians, they were, they were basically carrying on as if they were somebody because of their status. That's why Paul is saying, listen, if anybody want to do that in the flesh, I'm more. All right. And again, uh, I, I even I can make the same comparison. Most people want the and again, based on my experience of most preachers and bishops and all these people, they want the money and fame that I receive playing football. OK, that's what they want. They want the money and the fame to be talked about as this, that, that and the same thing in NFL or anybody who, who the world or society considers to be famous. OK, that's what they're seeking for. All of that I count but done for the knowledge of the excellency of Christ. I could care less about that, okay? All right, I caught all that but dumb because again, it's not, all of that doesn't really matter as it pertains to the things of God, all right? And that's what Paul is trying to deal with the Philippians about, all right? Status, it does not matter, all right? And in church, they, we, we got a hierarchy, all right? And I say this all the time, people, people believe that pastors and elders will have you think that they, they hear from God more than you do. That's not the case, okay? Right? We all are ambassadors of Christ. There's no hierarchy in the body of Christ. Right? God doesn't treat the pastor any different than he treats any other member. There's no hierarchy to it. Okay? So understand when it comes to the things of the body of Christ, we're all one body, members in particular. Right? We're all different parts of the same what? Same body. There is no hierarchy. The only thing that's the, 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 the greatest thing on our body, or that some would deem to be the greatest thing, is our what? My, our, our, my, our head. And who is our head? Christ. So there's no, that, Christ is our head. Everybody else, you just pick a spot on the body, that's where we are. Pastors, bishops, whatever. Right? But pastors will have you think that, oh, just come on up and let me pray for you. As if your prayer is going to be greater than their prayer. Right? And then people will be quick to turn around and say, well, you should know better because you're a pastor. No, you should know just as much as me because I'm of the same body as you are, right? So understand when it comes to this issue, right, dealing with the Philippians, it, it's all about status, and we see so much of that in the church today. Pastors will have you think they're greater than you, but when, you, when the pastor does something wrong, all right, now the people say, oh, well, you ought to know. But no, it's no hierarchy in the body of Christ. Everybody ought to know because we're all members of what? The same body. All right, members of the same body. Now, go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Good question. Look at verse 27, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, for he hath put all things under his feet, but... Excuse me, but when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things what? Under, under him. Excuse me. What, what is he speaking about in verse 27? The enemies destroyed. When he says, but when, say, when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. What does that mean? Everybody yeah, didn't believe. Huh? Everybody didn't believe yet. Uh-uh. Death. No. All things under his feet. Now, look at the first part. For, for he had put all things under his feet. For he has put all things under his feet. Who is he and his? God Christ. Okay. God Christ. But when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things what? So everybody didn't believe. Is evidence Except that he's God? What does it what does it what does the word now? Here we go. We have accept and accept. Right. Okay, so what does accept mean? The eternal man. The people outside. He's the only one. Huh? It's not what is it? If I say I like this cake everything is excluding one. Uh, 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 right, well, huh? It's excluding. It's excluding one. Okay, so watch this. All right. Is that what she said? Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, yeah, excluding one, all right? That's what that means, to so accept it. So now, based on that, what is this verse saying? Based yeah. on that definition, what is this verse saying? Yeah. Huh? 
Death he hadn't took over yet. Uh-uh. Say so except one? Yeah. He's the only one that could or that did do that. Okay. So for he had put all things under his feet, God put all things under the feet of Christ. But when he said all things, when God says all things are put under Christ, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Which means that God is not under Christ. He's accepted, he's excluding himself, who had put all things under the feet of Christ. That makes sense. Because God is not under Christ. Because look at the very next verse. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be what? Subdued. Unto him that put all things under him. Why? That God may be all in all. You see that? So God is accepted in the all things that are put under Christ's feet. You see that? He's, he's the exception. He's, he's the excluded one. Mm -hmm. Because even Christ will, after all things have been subdued, all right, will be subject unto the Father. Okay. All right? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, when I first read this, so so <laughs> when I first read this, I couldn't really understand the accepted part. Okay. How is the average person supposed to get that? Huh? How is the average person supposed to get that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the average person is supposed to get it. We're all in Christ, so we have the same spirit. So the average person will get it just like the above average or below average person, all right, by way of the spirit, okay? And so understand, and again, this took me quite some time to read and study uh, because I didn't, I didn't get this the first time I saw it. I'm saying accept it. It, just, it didn't sound like it made sense. Can you say it one more time for me? Huh? Say it one more time. Yeah, so, so basically God is putting all things under the feet of Christ except himself. Right, right. See that? So because when all things are subdued unto Christ, and he actually has manifested all things under him, then he himself will turn everything over to the Father. Okay. All right? And then all things, that way God will be all in all. You see that? So it's, it's, it's except everything is put under God, uh, everything under Jesus, except for God himself. Right. All right? Make sense now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I mean, that could be a little... Because it seems like it's worded wrong, okay? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, it seems that way. Yeah, so, so but, that, but, that, but that's what he's, he's saying. All things are because of that, okay? Now, in order for, understand, in order for us to be judged by God, he had to have been resurrected. In order for him to have all things under his feet, he had to have been resurrected. Paul says, in the day where all things will be judged according to what? My gospel, Romans 2, 16, right? But Paul's gospel is according to what? Let's go to 1 Timothy real quick. Look at 2 uh, second, oh, second Timothy. Did I say 1? 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's look at verse 8. Second Timothy 2, look at verse 8. Remember that who? Jesus. Of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to what? My gospel. Okay? So when it comes to God's judgment, it requires resurrection, and it's according to what? Paul's gospel. Okay? So that's what he's saying there. So when all things are put under his feet, it's in accordance to Paul's gospel. All right. In order for God to get the glory and be all in all, you have to have the knowledge of the mystery. If you don't, then you don't have the full picture. And if you don't have the full picture, then you don't understand the power of the resurrection as it pertains to the revelation of the mystery. Things that were kept secret. Christ being the head of the body. You don't get that anywhere else because he was their high priest back here. He wasn't the head of the body, which is the church. Okay, he was their high priest. So there are a lot of things as it pertains to the resurrection and Christ being raised from the dead. That's according to Paul's my gospel. Go, go to Romans four. Because Christ was raised from the dead, we receive free atonement and justification. Look at Romans four. Look at Romans 4, verse 25. 
who was delivered for our what? And was raised again for our what? So the resurrection, according to the mystery, tells us that we receive justification free of charge. Right? Free of charge. Because all things are going to be subdued unto him. All right? Now, look at verse... Look at, go back to verse 15, verse 28. I'll touch on this. I may not be able to get all into all of this, but I'll touch on it this here because I want you to see something. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things unto him, that God may be what? Oh, no. Now, is this happening right now? Huh? Because some people believe that we're of or in the kingdom right now as we speak. God, Jesus is on the throne and he's in, we're in the kingdom right now. No. Right, so watch this. All of these things have to happen. Now, what has already happened is that Christ already has received the what? Preeminence. All right? His, his, his power as judge, which is why he's called the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, that has already been established with his resurrection. All right? Go to Ephesians 1. Because in order for God to judge us, Christ had to have been raised from the dead. Because if, if, if there is no resurrection, there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, there's no head. If there's no head, there's no glory to God. Right? So all of these things have had to happen and has to still happen in order for God to be all in all. All right? Look at Ephesians 1. Look at verse 22. And had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his what? Right. The fullness of him that filleth what? All in all. So when he talks about all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son of Man, all right, be subject, all right, and then turn everything over to God, and God may be glorified all in all. Now, is Paul in your Bible, because I know y'all have the little things in the middle, right? What verse is Paul quoting? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. When he talks about when all things shall be subdued unto him. What verse are we just reading? You say verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. <laughs> what verse is he quoting? Luke 31, 3. Luke 1, 31. Uh-uh. That's not what he's quoting. He's quoting an Old Testament verse. Luke. He's quoting an Old Testament verse in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. When he says that when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And look, even verse 27, for he had put all things under his feet, but when he said all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. What Old Testament verse is this? He says Psalms. Uh-huh, Psalms. Let's go back there. Psalms 8. Let's go back there. This is also quoted in Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, I don't know if I have time to get all of it to this right now. Psalms chapter 8. Paul is, again... When it comes to the resurrection now, it was no secret, right? When it comes to the power and the knowledge of the resurrection, that is what, what was kept secret, okay? Look at Psalms chapter 8, look at verse 5. Uh, look at verse 4. Psalms 8, verse 4, we have it? Nope. Hold on. <laughs> I have a stick back. Verse 8, what? Yes, verse 8, chapter 8, verse 4 of Psalms. Okay. All right, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and a son of man that thou visitest him? 
For thou has made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put what? All things under his feet. All things under his what? Feet, okay? All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, okay? Uh, ma ma matter of fact, go back to verse 1 of this chapter. Our Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the what? Heavens. Above the heavens. Okay, so watch this now. All right, so when it comes to God putting all things under the feet of Christ, it was prophesied, all right, but the why of it was it was kept secret, and that's what we find out from the mystery. Okay, but Paul is quoting this because there were Jews that he was preaching to in 1 Corinthians, and also because it shows that the resurrection, all right, the resurrection, okay, was prophesied about even way back here. And these are things that they should have known, okay? So watch this. Now, let's go to Hebrews real quick so we can see this because it's quoted in Hebrews chapter number 2. Now, Hebrews is talking to who? Jews. To Hebrew people, okay? Again, this is not a book that's speaking to the body of Christ. This is the book to the Hebrew people, okay? Look at this, Hebrews 2. Let's look at verse... Eight. Six, huh? I got a question. When you get there. <clears throat> he, you said what now? Well, I said something to say uh, eight, verse eight. But you said yeah, six. yeah. We'll start at verse six, but yeah, we're gonna get go go to verse eight. Absolutely. What you had? Huh? Question: Ephesians ten. That same chapter you were just reading. Ephesians verse one and ten. 10 yeah. Yeah. Verse we, we, ten. Yeah. Of chapter one. Uh, let me make sure here. Yeah, just read it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah, look at this. Hebrews 2, look at verse 6. But one in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy what? <laughs> thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection unto him, he left nothing that is not put unto him. But now we see not yet what? All things put unto him. It's not happened yet. Yeah. Okay, we're not living in the kingdom because all enemies are not put under his feet and all things are not subject to him. Obviously so. Look